Turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 12, New Testament book of Romans chapter 12. Uh, I, I think today's really going to help you as we can sit, continue in this series called Mastermind. Um, and, and here's all we're doing, taking scripture and the latest scientific research, pulling them together and, and trying to help you regain control. Because I hear from so many people, they just feel like their mind constantly races and goes to places they do not want it to go. And so I want to help you master your thinking again. And, um, and so today I want to talk to you about really replacing wrong patterns of thinking. Not, not just one thought, but wrong patterns and how to replace those with God's fruitful thoughts for your life. Um, I was thinking about this, you know, Kayla and I make kind of an annual trip to her hometown to see her mom and dad and siblings. And because I have 17 children, it's too expensive to fly. And so um, we have to drive. It's an eight hour drive. Um, if you've ever wanted God to develop your character, you should take an eight hour drive with four small children. Um, you will either come out like Mother Teresa or on Xanax. You know, like one of the two is kind of the only options I've found. Now really, what's difficult about the whole drive is it's through a uninhabited kind of farmland, almost five hours of it, just nothing to look at. I, I mean, row after row of, of just crops and nothing else to look at. And, um, and I don't know if you grew up around, you know, farming at all. Um, I, I personally, we had a garden every year at our, our home. I don't do any of that now. I just buy my broccoli. No sense in fooling with the rest of it, you know. But um, if you know anything about gardening, one of the, the things that I learned is in order for the land to remain fruitful, you have to rotate the crops or change the pattern. Meaning that, um, you know, the corn's on the north end one year, and then it's on the south end the next year, because um, as you move it or change the pattern, it allows the soil to remain fruitful. Um, and it, that's easier said than done, because you're talking about things that have deep roots and ruts that have been dug very deep into the soil. So it takes a lot to change the pattern of the soil. And, and I bring that up because our brains work similar to the farmland I stare at on these drives. Your brain is filled with trillions of thoughts, um, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of rows of thoughts or pattern thinking, and, um, and it's really amazing to consider. Um, I don't know that you, you realize that your, your thoughts are not like ethereal, they're actually chemicals with electrons, and they have a physical nature to them. But like there, there's real thoughts with real real estate space in your brain. And if you wanted to see what a thought looked like, I, I found you a diagram of one. That's what a thought looks like in your brain. Um, it, it's, it's a neuron cell, and it, and it started when you started thinking something, and it, and it determines how big it gets is how much you think about it. Um, and, and, and I know you've noticed this kind of looks like a tree where your mind has orchards of orchards of orchards of trillions of these trees. And they also operate like a tree. Um, for example, in this little cartoon sketch, um, let's assume this is a thought in your life. The branches represent your conscious thinking, which is like what you're currently thinking, acting, doing, saying on whatever related topic we're talking about. So this is like, kind of like your behavior. Um, the trunk represents your subconscious thinking. So that's the memories or feelings, emotions that are tied or support your behavior. And, and then the root system is started when you receive a piece of information or have an experience. So, so let me say it this way. At some point, someone said something to you. You read something. You experienced something, and it planted a thought. And then your repeated thinking about that thought caused it chemically to grow um, and, and sprout. And then the more you've thought about it and the more you've acted on it, the larger the branches uh, and the leaves of your thought have become. Now, why is this important? This is important because what once was a sapling for some of you is now a sequoia. And that's the reason that it's so difficult to change because you're trying to uproot something with a massive root structure, strongly reinforced chemically, and that you have behaved in or said or done for a long period of time. And, and, and so um, from this, I, I, I want to warn you of kind of two things. One is you better watch what you put in your mind because your brain's formation really is affected by who speaks into your mind. 
But you also, you, you need to understand this, that the more you think about it, the deeper the roots get and the stronger the trunk gets. So let me say it this way. Your reality is this. It's the, it, your reality is based on the thoughts you chose to grow in your life. Now, I know that we, we don't like to take responsibility for kind of where our life is. We often want to blame someone else or a circumstance. And, and those things do contribute. But listen, nothing shapes your reality more than the thoughts you've chose to grow in your mind. Like, for instance, you think on faith-filled, God-true thoughts, you're going to eat of good fruit. You think on toxic, poisoned, you know, kind of polluted thoughts, you're going to eat the bitter fruit of that life. Because what you think about is what grows, and what grows is, determines how you, you believe, act, talk, and all these things. Now, um, I don't think there's any better picture than this than in the, the book of Numbers, chapter 13. The Bible tells us that the children of Israel have uh, been given a liberator named Moses. He comes to them and, and, and says, God's got our back. We can walk out of slavery in Egypt. So, so they leave under God's miraculous hand. I mean, things changing, miracles taking place, and they walk out, um, maybe you've heard, through the Red Sea, and they end up in a wilderness. But the wilderness was not their destination in God's plan. He had a promised land for them or a, a nation that he wanted them to become. So the wilderness was just meant to be preparation for what the promise they were going to receive. So they live out there, they get a little bit organized, and God says, it's time for you to take the promised land. And Moses chooses to send 12 spies into this area to do some reconnaissance. He wants to see, you know, who's in there? Is the land actually as fertile as God claims it is? Like, will we survive there? Before I march 3 million people into this place, I want, I want a little information. So the Bible tells us 12 spies go in, and they, they spend some time there, and, and they pull together all the information. And then they come back and give a report to Moses, the leader, and the whole nation about what they saw. And I want to show you that report. Here, here's what it says in Numbers chapter 13, starting with verse 25. It says, at the end of, everybody help me with this, 40 days. At the end of 40 days, that's very important. Um, they returned from exploring the land, and they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. And there they reported to them um, and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. So, so they come back not just with stories, but with proof of what God has said. They come back holding produce. They come back with soil samples that are rich. They come back showing, hey, this is everything. We're going to thrive over here. But in spite of what they're holding, their words start to, to, to reframe what they saw. It says that they gave Moses this account. Hey, we went into the land which was, you sent us to, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's the fruit of it. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. And the men who had gone up with him, they said, we can't attack these people. They're stronger than we are. And then they continue and say this, and they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. So they spread a bad report about a good land, and they said, this land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there were of great size. So they look at these, you know, it's like it's inhabited by these strong, capable, I mean, we, we seem so inferior compared to them. And, and they go on to say this, we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we looked the same to them. Now, now, this is, the result of this, this report spreads, and God's people decide not to follow God. They say, we don't want to go into the promised land if it's like that. And this reaction so displeases God that he says, okay, because of your unbelief or lack of trust in me, no one that is from this current generation will go into the promised land. Everyone will die in this wilderness, and I'll take your kids in. Okay? So, so listen, you just read this and you go, how does this happen? How? I mean, get it. they've heard God speak. They've seen him move miraculously. They're holding proof of his promise. Physically proof of his promise. And by the way, not a single enemy ever engaged them. There wasn't some enemy that said, y'all yeah, look like grasshoppers. No. They completely missed out on a good land because of a bad pattern of thinking. 
But, but, but don't miss this. How does this happen? It didn't just happen overnight. I actually believe had they went in for um, three days and came out, they would have been uneasy, but they would have went in. I think the key to this passage is 40 days. 40 days that took a seed of inferiority. 40 days, day by day, week by week, that watered a seed of inferiority until it grew to a powerful tree of fear that they could no longer see God's promise through the branches of their poison thinking. Listen, this tree was so powerful, it negated what God said and caused them to live outside the promise that God had for them. Now, I bring this up because I just think this is a lot of us. I do. I think many of you are here today, you're watching, and you're living, camping outside of God's promise for your life. You're camping outside of, of happiness, outside of community, outside of freedom from, from whatever the, the, the issue of your heart is. And you, it's not that you don't want it, and it's not that you don't hear me talk about it or promise it's out there. You just, you haven't been able to enter it at all. And it's not because of an enemy, and it's not because of an attack, and it's not because of, of, of a circumstance. It's because in your mind, you have allowed a massive pattern that is opposite of God's thinking to grow in your mind. And the sad part about where you are if you're in this place is you've got proof of God's faithfulness. Like, like these, these spies, you've got proof. Your kids are healthy. You know, your bills are paid. There's opportunities still before you. And in spite of all God's provided and all he said, your pattern governs your life. And it's causing you to live outside of what God has for you. And so the way I look at it is this, you just got two options. You either remain trapped or you replace that pattern. You either remain trapped or you replace the pattern. Let, let, let me say it this way. I'm not saying your feelings aren't real. I'm not saying circumstances that happened in the past didn't really happen. But I am saying you've never lost control of your thinking. It's always been under your control. It's always going to be under your control. You hold the steering wheel of your mind. Which means that today, today, you can choose to stop feeding a harmful pattern and you can start allowing God to process a transformation in your mind that leads you to a fruitful life. There, there's never been a moment that God has not offered you to start thinking differently and according to his word. And so I, I, I wanna help you today if you wanna make that choice because the promise that, that, that is available to you is found in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Maybe you've heard it before. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world's thinking, but be transformed by Pastor Joe praying over you. But be transformed by the magic wand they keep in the back, by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able, the result of your renewing, you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, and his, it's going to be good and pleasing and perfect. You're going to be able to know when it's your time to walk in that promise. So listen, though, but it's about renewing. Now, here's the thing about renewing that I, I've just got to, I got to get you to grasp. Renewing first is not a pill. It's not, a, it's not an escape. It, it's not a prayer. It's this. I'm going to put in some effort. You know, the scriptures never actually present our minds being changed by anything other than us getting in the soil and digging out what we believe. So it's going to take some, some effort, but guess what it's also going to take? Some time. It takes time to change. You don't grow trees overnight, and so it's going to take a little time. So if you can take responsibility and fight off impatience, you can live a fruitful life. So, so I want to teach you kind of today, just train you up on what you got to do um, to be able to do that. And, and we're really picking up where we left off last week because point number one is this, you got to recognize the root of wrong thinking. Now, I talked a lot about this last week, a lot about this last week. Um, so if this is your thing, like you say, I don't even know how to get control of my mind yet, the bad thoughts, the poison, it's just too much, go back and listen to last week's message. But, but what I talked about was this, that everybody wants to change. I don't know anybody that doesn't want to change and that doesn't try to change. What I know, though, is that when we try to change, we often just end up reverting back to what we used to do. 
Like we, it works for a little bit and then we, we, it stops working. And here's why is because we have a tendency to work on behaviors and not beliefs. Okay, so, so picture, we're trying to take down a tree by taking off a branch. And it just doesn't make any sense. You're not going to get rid of a sequoia by pulling off a few leaves. you you got to get rid of, of a sequoia by getting to the root and stop fooling with the fruit of the problem. Okay, and, and I want you to grasp this for, for yourself um, because I think a lot of you just spend a lot of time trimming branches and you're never seeing any change. And, and so what this looks like in your life is let's say today you are, um, you know, your, your problem, the behavior you want to change is gossip. You're just a gossip. How many people here today are gossips? Anybody? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, let, <laughs> um, now, let's assume you, you, you gossip. That means you talk bad about your boss, you know, when she's not around. You, uh, you, you know, you, you talk bad about your friends, about what they wear, the way they parent to your other friends. Um, you, 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 the minute somebody tells you something that shouldn't be shared, you share it. That's just, that's what kind of gossip looks like. It's what you do. It's just not, I mean, if you're a Christian, you call it prayer requests. But at the end of the day, it's gossip, right? Okay. So, so um, let's say that the Holy Spirit starts leading you to this idea that you, that you go, you know, I want that to change. That doesn't honor God. I want, it, I want to live a different life. And so you decide, that's it. I'm not doing it anymore. I'm going to make myself not gossip. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to control this tongue. And so, you know, you get to the, to the office and somebody says, hey, did you hear anything about it? And you're like, mm-mm, 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 mm-mm. And you run away from that person. Okay, you're, they think you're weird, but you didn't gossip, okay? Um, now then, but, and, and you go a couple days, and you're able to do that, but then eventually somebody comes up to you and says, Psst, this is something going on, some secret, don't, don't tell anybody, this, this is going on, just, just keep that, just, just pray about that, you know? And you, you, you so, I mean, like it's in, <laughs> I want to tell, <laughs> and you end up spilling it to the next person. And then you're frustrated with yourself. Why did I, I didn't want to do this. I don't want to do this. God don't want me. Why am I doing this? Let me tell you why. Because you're fooling around with behavior. Instead of the belief that says, I've got to put others down before they see my inferiorities. I, I, I need to point out someone else's less thans before they see my own. See, the fruit's gossip, but the root's insecurity. And, and that's what we, we're, we're trying to control our mouth when the problem's in our heart. And, and, and so you got to get to the root of these things. Like, for instance, if, if today you're here and a- angry outbursts are a part of who you are, that's the fruit. But the root is that you think you can only be happy when you're in control. And as, so, as soon as someone goes outside of your control, anger. Maybe you're here today and, and there's just, you cannot say no. You have an inability to say no. That's the fruit, but the root is, is that you think if you're agreeable, you'll be accepted, and you always want to be accepted. So therefore, you agree to things you don't even want to do. Some of you are here today, and, and there's an irrational fear you're living with. That's the fruit. You don't know why. You're like, why am I scared of this? This doesn't make any sense. But the root is that you live with shame because of your past, and you assume at some point God's going to punish you for what you did in the past. So at some point, you've got to get to the, to the root I remember at our first home, um, our neighbor wanted to plant some exotic plants, so in his yard, he planted bamboo. Bamboo was like one of the most invasive species on the planet, so it didn't take long for his yard to become my yard. And, and I remember going out there trying to, like, what in the, what, you know, and, you, and like, I'm out there with a machete, look like Rambo, cutting back, and the more I cut back, the thicker it came back. And so I'm, I, you know, I Google, like, what, what's the problem here? And here's what it, Google said is that you have to, Dig with bamboo, you have to dig much deeper than other plants to expose every root and then sever every one of them. If you leave just a little bit, it'll grow back. That's how how potent it is. So you've got to dig deep, 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 and then you have to sever every single root. And I love this. In the instruction, it said, all you need is a shovel and some sweat. (laughs) Listen, to get this process started, all you need is a shovel and some sweat. The shovel is the question, why? Why? Why do I act this way? Why do I react this way? Why do I feel this way? Why do I do that? Why have I always done that? Why do I believe that about these people? Why do I believe that about these type of certain? Why, 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 why? And you keep digging and digging, and then you just need some persistence that's not gonna give up at excuses and not gonna give up at, at well, I'm a victim and not give up because mom's always been that way, so therefore I am. You dig and dig and dig and dig and dig until you expose every root. And all I'm saying to you, until you can identify it, you'll never overcome it. Listen, 
Some of you are going to waste your entire life trimming branches when you need to get to the root of this issue so you can live a fruitful life. Okay? Now here's the second one. you got to replant God's thinking. Okay? Uh, let's do an exercise. I want everybody to participate online. You can do it as well. Um, I want you right now to think of a red truck. I'm going to know if you don't do it. Come on, everybody think of a red truck. I'm going to know. I'm going I'm to know. Sir, you're not thinking of a red truck. No, I'm kidding. Okay, red truck, red truck. Everybody thinking of a red truck? Nod at me if you're thinking of a red truck, red truck, red truck. Okay, stop thinking of a red truck. Stop. Stop thinking about a red truck. Quit thinking about a red truck. I, sir, stop thinking about a red truck. It's kind of impossible, isn't it? All right, let me help you. Um, stop thinking about a red truck. Start thinking about a yellow car. Start thinking about a yellow car. Think about a yellow car. See, this is a, a, a simple exercise for a really powerful truth that when it comes to your mind, you can't stop a thought, you can only replace it. Which means it does no good to take every thought captive if I don't plant a victorious thought where it was defeated. Okay, so, so listen, that's our problem. Our problem is, is we're fighting thoughts instead of planting freedom. Okay, so, so what that means is the only place to get victorious thoughts is in the mind of Christ, is what Scripture calls. Only place to get true thoughts, real thoughts, I mean absolute 100% always dependable thoughts, is the mind of Christ. And luckily, Scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians 2 and 16, you have been given the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. Now, I know some of you, Pastor, I do not think like Jesus. I'm going to be honest with you. If you knew what was happening up here, you would blush. You know, I mean, it's, listen, listen, you're reading it wrong. It doesn't say we have the mind of Christ in that like it possesses us. I follow Jesus and now I'm a zombie for him. That's not what that means. It means you have it in your possession so you ever choose to use it. You have it in your possession if you ever want to use it. So, so what is the mind of Christ? Oh, that's easy. That's the word of God. See, John says that, you say, well, I thought the Bible's a book and, and Jesus was a person. Oh, oh, that's true. But listen, here's what the Bible tells us in John. When he, he intros Jesus' is coming, he says, the word of God came and put on flesh to show us what it was like to live out what the book says. So, so, so get this. So if you want to know what Jesus thinks, you read the Bible. But if you want to know how to live the Bible, you look at Jesus. They're one and the same. That, that's literally, they're just one and the same. Which is why, if you've ever read the Gospels, I mean, it's just all through it. Like when Jesus is worshiping, Scripture flows from his lips. When Jesus is tempted, Scripture flows from his lips. When Jesus is, is, is challenged, it flows from his lips. When he's praying, it flows from his lips. When he's crucified, Scripture flows from his lips. Because he is the Word made flesh. Which is also, by the way, why when you read the Bible, you're not reading a book. You are engraving Jesus on your brain. That, 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 that's what makes it supernatural, by the way. It's not page and ink. It is the Word of God, the living Son of God, coming into your mind, pulling down wrong thoughts, releasing right thoughts, and renewing your brain. Science shows us that people who read Scripture, the formation of their brain actually changes because, because there's a supernatural quality to it. Now, now let, let me say this. Um, but, but here's the thing, you can't just, um, I, I guess I'd put it this way, you, you can't just read it, you got to plant it. Okay, so, so, so um, I, again, I don't know a ton about, um, is it horticulture? Is that what it is? Yes, somebody nod at me so I don't feel like an idiot. Yeah, it's horticulture, okay, thank you. Um, I don't know a lot, but I know this much, if I want corn, I have to plant Right, so I, I don't plant corn to get tomatoes. Okay, so it means that if I want to overcome in a specific issue, I've got to plant a specific verse. And that's the way this works. Um, for example, I, I'm going to show you. I told you I'm going to train today. Let's say that your issue is you have come to the conclusion, you wouldn't admit it to anybody, but you've come to the conclusion that um, you may be an overprotective parent. Okay, like you wrap your kid in bubble wrap before they go outside. You still cut, you know, their, their food up for them. They're 15. Um, you know, overprotective parent, okay? Um, and, and you're wondering, like, why am I like that? Now, your thought is this. If you dig, your thought is, well, being in control, I can keep my child from pain. Like, if I, if I control enough, I can keep him from pain. Chances are this was planted because you experienced pain. But this is your thought. So you got to dig this up. And you got to go get, I mean, it's obviously not true, so you got to go get God's thought. Here's what God's thought would say from John 16, 33. I have told you these things that you may have peace, 
But in this world, you're going to have trouble. There's nobody, no, nobody strong enough, wise enough, capable enough to protect people from having trouble. Your child's going to have trouble, but take heart, I've already overcome anything they're going to face. So this, the result of knowing this is no longer that, that I live by worry. I live by peace now because I know no matter what they face and what I, where my limits in, God's continue. So, so I replant that thought. Let's say your issue is overspending. You're here today, credit card, our, our credit card accounts are piling up. You know, your first name basis with Amazon. You know, I mean, like, like they just, that's it. You love the labels. You love stuff. You, I mean, you just love it. And you just, it's, it's a problem. You want it to change. You dig, 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 dig to the root. And here's your thought. Your thought is, if I had more, then I'd be happy. I'm only happy for the 10 seconds when that box arrives and then I go back to not being happy. Okay, well, if that's the, that's the root, then we gotta plant something. Let's plant Hebrews 13.5. Keep your lives free from the love of money. Now listen, money's not a problem. When money has you, it's a problem because your steps are supposed to be ordered by the Lord, not your bank account. And so he says, keep free from the love of money and be content with what you have. But I, but I can't be content. Oh, yes, you can, because God has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And the reality is this, that God can give you what Amazon could never deliver, that he's always present, always protecting, always giving. He can touch deep places in your heart that the labels on your clothes can never get to. And, and so I focus on this, right? I'm telling you, this practice saved my life, something I still practice today. This week, I read scriptures that I keep on my phone just to combat certain thoughts. March 2017, I, I got to a place where I was just overwhelmed, and I, I, I had a just residual thought, I can't do this. I can't make all the decisions. I can't, I can't, I can't come up with sermons every week that people need. I, I mean, it's just too much to me. Schedule too many, too much at stake, too many people, too much, too much dollars. All, and God, I'm not strong enough. I, I can't do this. And, and it just pervasive thought, pervasive thought. It got to the place where I didn't enjoy this. I was anxious about this. Okay? And um, so one day I, I, I'm desperate and I just go to God and I sit down and I say, God, you're going to have to change something. And I pray and ask him to, to fix whatever it is. And he did nothing. <laughs> nothing changed. Nothing. Still as anxious, still as bothered. Nothing. Um. So I just, okay, well, then I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just do what i got to do. I'm going to do the Bible reading plan. Chapter 1, done. Chapter 2, done. Chapter 3, verse jumps off the page. Here's the verse, 1 Timothy 1, 12. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy, which means he knew all my shortcomings, and instead still appointed me to serve him. This is the top verse still on my notes that I keep in my phone. I read it every week. Here's what I learned in this, though, because peace is what followed using this verse, and here's why, here's why. I had rejected all kinds of thoughts, but I hadn't replaced them. And when you only ever go in life rejecting thoughts, you get worn down and tired. But if you learn to plant a verse in the place where the thought used to be, fruitfulness starts to bloom. Listen, I don't know what your issue is, but I know there's a verse for every victory you need. Verse for every... So you don't have to know the whole Bible. You just have to know the next verse that gives you victory over the problem you got. Now, here, here's the, it's just not just getting it, though. Last, we have to repeat God's thinking until you see results. Repeat God's thinking. Remember, repetition's what built the tree, so repetition is what's going to grow the next tree. Okay, but that means I can't just read can't just, just go through reading. I, ha I have to do more. I have to internalize it, okay? Um, so so let, me, let me say it this way, that um, like Psalm 119.11 is an illustration of this. Here's what he says. I have thought much, not like I thought one time. I thought much about your words and stored them in my heart so that, I, that they would hold me back from sin. Now, now listen, sin is not bad behavior. Sin is thinking opposite of what God thinks. No, 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 I thought sin was when I do something bad. No, no, no. Remember, behavior is just the fruit of a belief. So sin doesn't start with behavior. Sin starts with wrong beliefs. And, and, and so what he's saying is, is I thought so much about this problem I was having and your word in it. I thought so much that it actually internalized in me that when I went to do that behavior, your word gripped me and kept me from doing an unfruitful thing. Now, how does that happen? 
Well, it, it's found in a word that, that is a little, you know, people are a little weird about. It's a word, meditation. Meditation does not mean you get out your, your yoga mat, okay? Meditation is one of the most misunderstood and underutilized biblical principles. Uh, it, it'll be the difference between victory and defeat in your life. See, meditation, it, what it does is it allows me to focus on what God's saying till it moves from my mind into my mind, my spirit, my heart, my soul. It becomes a part of who I am. Okay, now let me say it this way. This is huge because today scripture is easier than ever to access but harder to absorb. We've got people who have scripture in their pocket living in defeat. It's not an access problem. It's an absorbing issue. It, it, we own more Bibles than we've ever owned and still living less than what God has ever had for us. It's not access, it's absorbing is the issue. And so we have to get to the place where we will focus repeatedly, focus repeatedly until it becomes a part of who I am. Now, some of you say, I, I, how does that work? I mean, is that, what does that look like? Let me show you. Let's say today that your issue is fear. You came here with fear. You were hoping to leave with somebody praying for you and fear was solved and fear is just ruling your life, okay? I've got a verse for you. Here, here, here's the verse. Um, 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. I know people who read this verse and still live in fear. They have access to this verse, but they don't absorb it, okay? So here's what you're going to do. You're going to take this verse, and tomorrow you're going to get up and you're going to read it. For God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. And then before, you, you're going to do it at lunch, and you're going to do it at, at dinner, you're going to just keep coming back to this verse. We're not going to read a bunch of chapters. I'm going to read this verse because i got a fear problem. And then day two, you're going to get up, and you're going to say, I need, I need to do more, so I'm going to, for God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and sound mind, and I'm going to write it out because when I engage myself in writing, my memory or attention goes up. And I, I might even read it out loud because um, research tells us that when we verbalize things, it, it activates auditory cells that build thoughts quicker. So I, I'm going to read, for God has not given me a spirit of fear, but power, love, and sound mind, and I'm going to keep doing it. And then on day three, I'm going to get up and say, okay, Pastor Joe said I should do this. For God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Well, I don't feel any different. Pastor Joe is so full of it. But on day four, you're going to get up and go, for God has not given me a spirit of fear, fear. What am I fearful about? Fearful about my kids. Fearful about if I'm going to have enough to pay the bills. Kind of scared of what's going on in my work right now. Fearful about what's going on in the news. Got fear. But God's not giving me power, love, and a sound mind. Next day, you're going to get up and go, for God's not giving me a spirit of fear. Now I know the specific fears we're talking about. What has he given me? Power. What kind of power? Well, I, I've heard that God's power is unlimited. It's, 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 it's hard to even grasp. It's called resurrection power. Resurrection power, that's interesting because that means that no matter if even a situation is dead, God can bring it back to life, that I literally could lose my life and God could bring me back to life. That's how powerful he is. I mean, that's a lot of power, so there's really nothing I could fear that God's power even compares to because it's resurrection power. And then the next day you're going to show up and go, for God's not giving me a spirit of fear, but a power and love. Love, what's love? Lo love's how I feel about my kids. You know, I'd do anything for my kids. Ding, 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 ding. God loves me. He would do anything for me. He would protect me, provide for me. He would keep me. He would never let anything go wrong in my life, that, that it would overcome me. He'd never let the enemy have me. I mean, God loves me. Can you believe God loves me? He loves me. That means, I, well, what am I worried about? If God has all this power and all this love, this doesn't make any sense. The next day, for God's not giving me a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. And sound mind means I get to make a decision about what happens in my mind which means on that day, fear tries to knock at the door and you said, I'm sorry, fear, you're not allowed in here because I'm back in control because God's got all this power and this love for me and now I don't have to be at your will any longer. It's moved from something I know to now when I'm walking through the office and all of a sudden a fearful thought comes, I don't have to pull out my phone, pull out a sheet of paper. I go, "For I, God has not given me that spirit. I'm not taking that fear. He's given me power to overcome anything that you claim and love because he loves me so much that I can always count on him and I've got a sound mind and refuse to participate in that right now. That's what it looks like. Listen, here's what's happened scientifically. Scientifically, you're recruiting new neurons that come in and build deeper pathways, and they're literally changing the formation of your brain. But spiritually speaking, you're actually upgrading your thoughts to God's thoughts to where it now goes in and upgrades your words, your thoughts, your feelings to his thoughts and feelings so that when fear does come, you know it's not of him, and without even having to think, you reject the premise and continue to walk in priest of fruitful thinking. A simple verse can give you a significant victory. But I know what some of you are thinking as we close up today. Yeah, but that seems like a lot of work. Man, that's like, a, like, I've got a job. I can't just, I mean, how are you supposed to do that? 
It is. <laughs> it is work. It's worth it, though. But I don't want you to think of it as work. I want to reframe how you think of it. In 1978, Diana Nayad attempted for the first time to swim the Florida Strait, 110 miles from Cuba to Florida. She made it 78 miles before the wind got so large she had to, to stop, and she gave up. That dream of swimming, being the first person to swim the Florida Strait, lay dormant for 30 years, and at 60 years old, she tried for the second time. About 40 miles in, she ended up um, having an asthma attack, had to end. She tried another two more times that both were ended early because she kept getting stung by jellyfish. At 64 years old, she tried for a fifth time, and on August 31st, 2013, she became the first person to swim from Cuba to Key West, Florida. It took her 53 hours. How? I mean, how do you do that in spite of failing so many times? How, how do you do what no one's ever done? How do you do that at 64? I struggle to get out of the bed in the morning, and I'm 35. How? She was asked that question, and she said it traces back to her fifth birthday. On her fifth birthday, her father, Aristotle Nyad, invited her into his study, put her up on his lap, and opened an unabridged dictionary. He opened it to the, the, the original phrasing of her last name, Nyad. And he said, today I'm going to tell you something that will be the most important thing I ever tell you. And he showed her her name, and then he showed her the first definition. The first definition was of a Greek mythology nymphs that protected the lake's waters for the gods. Then he moved his finger down to the second definition that said, a female championship swimmer. And he looked at her and winked and said, this is your destiny. So how does someone do what no one else has ever been done? How does someone continue on when everyone else would have quit? It's because her thoughts at some point became her father's thoughts. And it caused her to prevail in spite of sharks and jellyfish and hallucinations and dehydration. Her thoughts aligned with her father's thoughts. This is not a mental exercise. This is allowing what your heavenly father has said about you to imprint and transform you into the destiny that he set for you before you were ever in existence. This is allowing him imprint on you. Listen, you, you're not showing up to read, to go through an exercise. You're showing up to let his words wash over you so that you can inherit every single promise he has for you. And those who do will eat of the fruit. And those who don't will live with bitter fruit. And so your next step is replacing these patterns of unfruitful thinking. But listen, he renews you read, you consume his word, he does the changing. You don't have to fix you, you just have to fill your mind with his thoughts and he'll do all the work. Will you bow your heads? I wanna pray for you. Hey, what's up guys? We hope that this message you just heard blessed you. To always get our newest messages and to stay up to date, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click that bell icon to be notified every time we upload. Now, while you're here, go ahead and check out our page and some other messages we've got and we'll see you next time.